Ah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sean van Berg. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, today we're discussing investment strategies. We can discuss value investing, uh, growth at a reasonable price, and uh, the investment strategy for investing for dividends. Um, my name, as I say, is Sean van Berg. I head up client education at PSG Online. Um, so, uh, as we do with every webinar, um, this presentation is being recorded. Um, so I, I will be sending the presentation to you guys as well as the recording um, in the next few days as such. Um, any questions you guys have, please just uh, type them up in the box and then we, as we go along we we'll try and answer them. If I can't answer them within the presentation, I'll answer it at the end or um, I'll also follow up with the email. Okay, so let's get started. Um, here's my agenda. We're going to discuss basically two parts. Um, Developing a, a, a personal uh, investment philosophy or investment strategy for yourself. And then we're going to discuss, obviously, most of the time we spend on uh, discussing the, the value investing approach, uh, growth at a reasonable price, and investing for income. Those are the three main um, strategies that a lot of people use. I personally like to use a blend uh, of all three in my portfolio. Um, so, as I say, it's just developing your own investment strategy. So, let's get into the nitty gritties. Um, I hope you guys can hear me clearly. If anybody can just uh, type in a little box that you can hear me, I appreciate that. Because um, sometimes we do have some sound problems. Okay. Um, good. So, let's get started. Going to more, as I say, more detail now. Um, we can discuss investment uh, philosophy and developing an investment strategy. So first of all, I want to make some assumptions. I'm assuming that uh, uh, you've accumulated some knowledge, if you, you've gone through uh, the online tutorials, for example, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, um, basic share market concepts. I'm, I'm assuming that you understand a bit more of the market, what's a share, what's a stock market, and things like that. You understand a bit more about fundamental analysis, be it macros and, and micros. Obviously, uh, basic share market concept is, is discussed in tutorial one, and um, Macro fundamentals is discussed in three and micro fundamentals is discussed in, in four. But also assuming that you understand the differences between analyzing diff different sectors of the economy, be it industrials versus in, uh, financials and resources. And that's all covered in, in tutorial uh, five. So this presentation today, this webinar presentation is based on tutorial number six, which is uh, investment strategy. So you can go read up on, on that. And that's all available on the website for free. But the main objective for today for you to understand that this is ongoing financial education. You never stop learning about the market. My objective today is to help you make better, well-informed investment decisions. So that's a framework that I want to uh, build around, uh, just to help you make, uh, as I say, uh, a better informed decision. It's all part of that decision-making process. Okay. So let's start off uh, with uh, developing a, a investment philosophy. There are good and bad things about having an investment philosophy. So first, there's three, there's three areas as such. Your personal characteristics. So you know, when you're developing an investment philosophy, it depends on your personality. You know, some investment strategies uh, won't really be apply, uh, applicable to you. So you, know, you might be worrying at night, lying in bed, and you're worried about your investments. Uh, maybe the, 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 the strategy you've chosen doesn't fit you. Um, a lot of investment strategy, we do, well, especially the ones we talk about today, the value investing, does uh, need a lot of patience. So, you know, patience is a virtue and a lot of us don't really have that. So maybe value investing is not for you. Um, some investment approaches might use more uh, risk on, um, so increase the uh, risk, whereas you as, a, as an investor might be risk averse. So um, that, that all comes back to... Um, having a, a, a philosophy, and that comes back to knowledge on the stock market. So um, some of us might uh, go the, go, uh, like to follow the, the, the crowd, uh, that's where we talk about individualism, or we like to do that by ourselves. Uh, a lot of the approaches we discussed today is what we call criterion. When we are selling, you're going to be buying, or when everybody else is buying, you're going to be selling, um, and vice versa. Um, also your time horizon, you know, the so some investment approaches might take a bit longer, and that's hence the, the patience um, that, you, that you might uh, need as such. Um, but obviously, the idea is that 
you know, when I talk about time, it's also the resources. You know, you have to kind of do a lot of analysis and things like that, which takes a lot of time. So some of you might not like it. So as I say, it's, it's all it's all part of the package. And when it comes to age, obviously, um, as you as you get older, as you mature, you might not be willing to take on more risks. But also, as you get older and you've been involved in the market longer, you might also have a lot of baggage for past experience. So all these things are all part of the, of the as I say, the package. Um, the second part, obviously, your financial characteristics, uh, your job security, the amount of capital that you've got to invest, uh, your cash, your immediate cash needs, as well as your tax status also dictate your, your investment philosophy. As I say, if you go to lie in bed at night and you're worried about your, your share portfolio, um, or the day-to-day -day movements of the portfolio, or you're second-guessing uh, your investment choices, then you need to reconsider your investment strategy. So I always say it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a work in progress. Uh, at such time that you've tweaked it and you feel comfortable with it, and it's working for you, then it's great. Um, and then obviously the third part of the, of, the, of the investment philosophy is your beliefs about the market. Obviously we have different viewpoints on the market, and that's why we have a market so you need to have a view of what is the market is actually, you know, and what does it do, and what does it mean to you? Uh, is the market random, or is it syst uh, systematic, or is it a combination of both? Uh, and so you, you need to develop your, 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 your beliefs around the market itself. Okay. So that's just bit some background information, uh, building up towards developing your own strategy. So the idea is to start formulating a, a coherent or clear way of thinking about the market. So it's your set of beliefs uh, as an investor, how you should behave when the market reacts certain ways. Um, and obviously how you make this, those decisions. So it all comes down to having what they call a world view. Uh, are financial markets and the world stable? And the answer I believe is no. Uh, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty and volatility on the market. But that would create the greatest opportunities. Uh, so Having investment philosophy is important. On the other side of the point, not having investment philosophy, you're going to be living on tips and, and hunches and dreams and other people's opinions about the market. And obviously that leads to poor investment uh, decisions and ultimately poor results. So uh, saying that, you know, just having a good investment philosophy won't really help you be successful. You need to combine that with, with discipline and patience. So we talk about having a temperament towards the market. Um, I like this analogy where you can compare it to having a good diet. Um, it only works if it's sensible over the long haul, so obviously over the long period, and you have the discipline to stick to it. So once you've established a solid uh, a foundation, it's ongoing. You never stop learning, as I say, about the market. So it, yes, it does take some hard work. Um, I believe it's once you understand what to look for, it becomes smart work. So it also takes a lot of focus, excuse me, focus, patience, and experience. Okay. I'm going to see if there's any questions coming through in the meantime so long. Okay. Clear, thanks. Great. Thanks, Andres. Uh, thanks for the feedback, guys. Um, yeah, you clearly. Great. Excellent. So this presentation is being recorded. Okay. Um, okay, let's move on. I think this is uh, making sense to you guys. This is just a bit of a framework as we build up towards uh, some of the, the, uh, the strategies as such. Okay. So before we get started, and, uh, very similar to trading, you need to have an investment plan. Okay, we have talked about a trading plan, we have an investment plan. Before you can start uh, building a portfolio, you need to know what is your strategy. Your strategy should basically reflect who you are. So why are you investing in the market? Everybody says, yes, I want to make money. But um, what do you want to do with that money? So that's all part of your financial objectives and things like that. So I always find it useful to try and create an a investment uh, strategy on a one page. Uh, if you can summarize your whole strategy on one page, it's concise. Um, that's the kind of thing you're looking for. Um, I, I read somewhere once, I think it was from Robert Kiyosaki, he says, um, show me your financial plan and uh, will I get excited by it? And that's the kind of thing you want to look at when you have your financial plan, um, uh, especially when it comes to your investment strategy. So some of the things that you need to discuss in your investment strategy is your time frame. Obviously, we're focusing mainly on investing today and we're talking about investing uh, maybe your time horizon, that's the difference between a trader and an investor, your time horizon is obviously much longer. So yeah, we're talking about three years, two, three years plus uh, and longer. Your time, your time involvement, obviously we talk about uh, being an investor, so it's not, it's not active management like day-to-day -day trading, this is what we call more passive, 
But how much time are you going to be spending? Are you going to be watching your portfolio on a daily basis? Are you going to be tweaking your portfolio on a weekly basis or, or, or changing it on a monthly basis? You need to decide it up front um, how much time you're going to be spending on your portfolio. I won't just uh, buy some shares and ignore them. And obviously it depends on the quality of stocks in your portfolio. Uh, your risk tolerance, uh, that also dictates what kind of shares you'll have in your portfolio. So we're talking about blue chips. These are companies that have been around for a long time, good consistent management and, and good consistent man, uh, 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 financial results. We talk about green chips. These are the growth companies. We also talk about the, the, the red chips. These are the speculative, a bit more riskier kind of companies. So if you're looking at more of the, the red chip shares, obviously um, you've got a higher risk tolerance uh, and things like that. Remember, this is an investment portfolio. You're not buying to shares that have been around for a long time. So, you know, and that's what it comes back to uh, the, 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 the fourth step here, the, the investment method. Are you even looking at large, well-established leaders? That's mainly the, what we call the top 40 or the top 100. That makes up the large caps, which is the top 40. The next 60 companies, which is the, the mid caps. Or you can look at more the, what you call the up and comers, the small caps. So anything that's not in the top 100, we classify that as small caps. Okay. I like to have a bit of a blend of, of all of them. Um, obviously, I like the small caps, but we were talking about it just now, but quality is important okay, so when you're looking at small caps. So how many shares do you want to own in your portfolio? And we'll discuss that also just now. Your financial goals, um, remember we said you want to make money, but how much uh, returns do you want to make on an annual basis? Now, I believe that you want to make 15% plus per annum, working on, on, on inflation of 6%, plus a bond market of about 6%, and I'm adding a bit more. So remember the goal is consistently. If you're looking at 15, you're growing your portfolio by at least 15% per, per annum, you're looking at every uh, uh, three years plus your, your portfolio by growing by at least 15%. That's just a goal, a goal as such. Um, some of you might have higher goals than that, uh, but remember that the trick is consistently in bull markets and bear markets. But also it's important to understand when will you make, when would you sell a share in your, in your long-term portfolio? What criteria would you have? And there's all the kind of things you need to have written into this investment strategy of yours. Um, when would you change your investment strategy? One minute you're a value investor, one minute you're a growth investor, one minute you're a, a, a investing for income. So, you know, as well, I prefer to have what a, a bit of a food seller's approach, so you don't change your investment strategy radically. Okay. The main idea about having this little document is to prevent you from moving backwards and forth in and out the market when the stock market rises and falls. Okay. So, if you have the right strategy and you're sticking to it over the long period of time, you should be successful. So, you know, fortunes are made by working hard and laying down flexible guidelines. So, this is not in stone, it's flexible, but ultimately you're managing your money and managing your share portfolio. That's what this, what this document should be aiming to do. Okay. Okay, let me see if there's another questions coming through. Very clearly. Okay, great. So, I hope you guys are, are with me. Good. So far, no questions. Okay. So, there's two approaches to the market. We talk about a top-down approach and we talk about a bottom-up approach. I like to use both. Um, some people like to use uh, more of the bottom-up approach, especially when it comes to value investing and things like that. Um, so I like to use both in the sense that uh, it doesn't hurt having both. I, I look at it, it doesn't help. It doesn't hurt. Um, the idea is like a funnel, a lot of information going through the top and then you filter through and it comes out the bottom, a lot of information. Um, I like this idea of this, uh, what they call the 80-20 uh, 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 rule, in the sense that um, um, you know, 20% of, your, of, of, uh, of, your, of something is responsible for 80% of your results. So my, my, my goal is that if I can find 20% uh, uh, of the top stocks, it will add to 80% of my top performance. Okay, so that's what my, my focus is always, is trying to find those top 20 performers which will add 80% add of my results. If I can just add that in my portfolio and I'm winning, um, uh, that's the kind of thing you're looking for. Okay, so you know, it's, 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 it's what they say, the vital few and the trivial many. There's, there's more than 400 stocks in the market, it's impossible to follow everything, um, so you need to chunk down. Ultimately, uh, and this is the process of that chunking down, Look at international markets, what's happening in the States, what's happening in, in, in Asian markets, and all the economic indicators, inflation, interest rates, what's happening, having a view on exchange rates, having a view 
on the gold price for the platinum price. How does that all affect the, the local market? When I say local market, JC all share. And from there, we break it down into industry, financials, industrials, and mining. Within those different industries, looking at specific sectors. So, um, you know, for example, in the financials, I might say, okay, there's opportunities now in the banking sector. Within that banking sector, I might chunk down to, to individual uh, banking stocks, like be it Barclays Africa, the old APSA, uh, or NetBank, or Standard Bank, etc. And then ultimately, I want to get to a stage where I've got a checklist. I've got a fundamental checklist, fundamental criteria. Does the share meet my criteria? I've got a technical criteria. Does the share meet my technical criteria? Does the share meet my portfolio criteria? And this is the process you'll go through. Okay. So this is just one of the one of the ways to keep the thing on the pulse where the opportunities are. This is what I use for prospecting, looking for opportunities. Remember, that's what we call a, a top-down approach. So we'll talk about a bottom-up approach a bit later. Okay. So the idea with a bottom-up approach is that you want to evaluate the company itself. So the more you know about the business, the better. I always say the better, the better you know the business and its industry and the sector and its industry. So we're now going from the bottom up, uh, the better. So a lot of people just look at, uh, at the shares itself. When I say the shares, that's the share price and, and ignore the actual underlying business. So it's, it's more tangible than that in the sense of just share price going up and down. You must understand that you actually, as a shareholder, have a small uh, claim uh, on that actual business. So for example, you, I'm using the example of pick and pay. You might be a pick and pay shareholder. You and Raymond Ackerman are sharing in the, in the spoils of that company. Uh, whereas obviously the Ackerman family own much more than the company, your share still counts. You can also still uh, approve members to the board of the directors. You send in your ballot and you can solicit your vote. But also think about it this time. Every time a shopper buys groceries, get a set of towels, or even a television, a tiny fraction of that profit from that sale generated is yours. Okay. So um, it's more than just the share. It's the underlying business. So the more you understand the business, uh, the better. So successful investors, uh, 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 they become familiar with the companies that they own. And that's, I think, is one of the things I learned from Warren Buffett. He gets to know the company so well, and obviously puts himself onto the board of the company. Obviously buys enough shares to do that, but he does a whole due diligence about the company. And he keeps up to date and what's with the developers of the company. And that's what successful investors do. Okay. So in past webinars, we've discussed many measures. When we say measures, it's valuation measures and research tools available on the website. And I'll be touching on it again today, uh, the tools as such, to help you in your share valuation. So in the past, we looked at things like uh, valuations, like P-E ratios, and PEG ratios, and price NAV, profitability ratios, and in uh, risk management, uh, we'll talk about debt equity and more specifically, interest cover. I want to focus more specifically on things called, debt, uh, called quality and price today. And there's two questions that you want to ask yourself all the time. Is this a strong and growing company, or a strong and growing and high quality company? And also, is the company share price priced attractively right now relative to its earnings? So the challenge is that uh, there's always two scenarios. You might end up with a grossly overvalued company, or that might be a wonderful company that's very overvalued. Or you might end up with a, 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 a miserable company that's doomed, um, but it might be seen at a, a bargain prices. Those are the two extremes. So that's what I'm going to discuss today. Okay. So there's the, the three aspects as such, quality, price, and value. Um, so when it comes to quality, and this is what we do on the website, does it all for you, is it company debt free? Um, yeah, we're looking at, well, you know, debt can be a, a, a good thing if it's, not, if it's managed properly, but it can also be a bad thing. Um, that can also spoil a lot of trouble if it's not managed properly. So we prefer to look at each cover. Uh, as long as it's uh, a cover more than three times, we say it's fine. Below that, the little alarm bell should be ringing. Is the company generating enough cash and is it, is it using its money more efficiently? Uh, all these different things uh, that you want to look at. I'm not going to go into too much detail now because um, as I said, we have touched on these before. Um, so now when you get this presentation, please go through the notes uh, in more detail. Okay. Um, let's get into more of the investment strategies. Okay, um, let's talk about value investing. Uh, value investing was, is an investment model um, that was derived from the ideas of two professors. They were at Columbia uh, Business School, uh, Benjamin Graham and, and, and uh, David Dodd. Um, obviously, Benjamin Graham became more famous than, than, than David Dodd in the sense that uh, Benjamin Graham was ultimately Warren Buffett's mentor. But they began teaching this investment model way back in 1928, 
and I wrote a, a, a document called Security Analysis way back in 1934. And that ultimately became the um, led to value investing and such. But Benjamin Graham is regarded as the father of value investing. And he was involved with a, fund man with a, a mutual fund or a unit trust for over a 20 year period um, from 1936 to 1956. And he, he, he had a good record as a stock picker. So over the, over the 20 year period, the compound average return was at least 14.7%, uh, which compared to the overall market of 12%, was very, very good. Remember, it's average return. So sometimes, obviously, it's better and sometimes it's a bit worse. But uh, it doesn't sound a lot, you know, 2.7%. But if you had invested that uh, $10,000, the difference would have been roughly about 60000 So uh, that's where it becomes uh, important. But um, Benjamin Graham is, is famous for, uh, for quoting that the value investment is the only real form of investment. If anything else was pure speculation. So obviously that was at that point at that time uh, quite controversial. Okay, but value investing takes many forms. Um, basically, you you're a bargain hunter. You're looking for for uh, companies that are underpriced uh, based on various fundamental criteria. You're either looking for companies that are trading at a discount to net asset value, or discount to tangible net asset value. Obviously, that's taking goodwill out of it. You're looking for companies that are trading on a high dividend yield. Or companies trading at a low price to earnings multiple or multi, uh, low uh, PE ratio, or you're looking for companies trading at a low price to NOB uh, ratio. And so we have discussed these in, in, in past webinars before. But basically, this, a, a value investing is a defensive investment approach to the market. You don't find companies that are uh, 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 um, trading, as I said, at discount, but you want to safeguard against adverse uh, future developments. And this is where uh, Benjamin Graham coined the phrase also, the margin of safety. On the next slide, you see the uh, little quote from Benjamin Graham. That margin of safety refers to a price so low that you can make money even if some part of your analysis turns out to be wrong. Okay. So a true value investor wants to buy companies that the rest of the market is thinking lousy. Everyone else is selling the stock off, you want to analyze the company even more, there's, there's opportunity here. So, Benjamin Graham used a thing called net current asset value, or in CAV approach. So he was looking at companies that are trading way below the calculated value. So instead of just using the NAV, which is uh, what we use as tracking the assets minus liabilities divided by the number of shares and issues, that's what we call NAV. He was looking for companies that, if they were liquidated tomorrow, what would the company be worth okay, tomorrow? So it only included current assets. And current assets includes obviously the cash, that's the cash in the till, cash in the bank, uh, our inventory, our stock, plus our debtors. He knew, ignored the long-term assets such as buildings and things like that. So you subtract long and short-term liabilities from that and basically you're looking for companies trading in a heavy discount. You're looking at things uh, trading at two-thirds or less than the uh, uh, net uh, current asset value. Now, over the last 20 years I've been in the market, I haven't seen this for a long time. So, um, but that was the approach he used way back in, 19, in 1934. Okay. So he's looking at a heavy weight discount. We use a rule of thumb, we would prefer to use the price NAV and, and the peg ratio. So there are common uh, 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 mistakes or, or misperceptions uh, regarding value investing. A lot of people think value investing is just looking at discount to NAV or a low PE ratio and we ignore the quality of the business or ignore the, the growth in earnings. That's not really true. Whereas value, where growth investing uh, looks at uh, companies looking at high rates and ignores price and ADP ratios. Um, that's not really true either. Okay, Value investing, bottom line is, is bargain hunting. If you're looking for companies that are trading less than the intrinsic value. When I say what's the intrinsic value, okay, that's the biggest challenge when it comes to value investing. There's no correct intrinsic value. You have two investors looking at the same information, uh, they'll place a different valuation on the company. Or it is, you're trying to es estimate what's the, 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 the value of the company relative to its price. Okay. So we use that rule of thumb of price NAV or a, 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 the low PE ratio relative to its expected growth. And that's where the peg ratio goes in. Those are the two approaches we use at PSG a lot. Okay. So that's a quick introduction to value investing. Obviously, there are problems with it. Uh, compared to technical analysis, value investors need a, a lot more information. 
lot more documents to go through. So yes, can seem labor intensive, um, but saying that, a lot of the work is done for you already. And I'll show you on the next slide that on our website, uh, we have tools for the uh, value filter and, and, and value search uh, that does all the work for you. So it does seem intensive if they're going to do it without that tool. Um, that's one of the disadvantages. Other the, uh, perception is that a lot of companies will be taken private. It's what they call management buyouts. Obviously, companies trading at, at a discount, and companies, uh, the management of the company see more value in it. Let's take it private out of the uh, out of the limelight. Let's work on the company, bring it back later at a higher value. Uh, and that's companies like NAMPAC, uh, the Thomas NAMPAC, uh, the Consult Glass, and we see the Econ uh, quite a few times. But uh, one of the biggest disadvantages or one of the challenges with value investing is you have to wait for the rest of the market to look at the, uh, at, at, the, at the value in the company. So you need lots of patience and wait for the market to, to, to see the value and, and push obviously the price up. So value investing might not be for you if you don't have the patience. Okay. So on our website, once you've logged in, you can click on, if I can bring my little cursor in here quickly, um, uh, my spotlight. Once you've logged in, you click on a little button called Research. You click on a little button there called uh, Search. There are shortcuts for you. And this is just a, a quick way of, of, of finding opportunities. In this situation here, I click the little button here called uh, Undervalued Shares. I call it a shortcut. I call it defaults. But anyway, there's my criteria I'm looking for. I'm looking for shares that, that are basically uh, uh, on a peg ratio trading between 35 and 75 and a quality rating of 70. But... Uh, at the moment, this is I did uh, two days ago on, on Monday. You can see there, there wasn't much value in the market, and that's been happening for quite a while now. It's roughly about ten companies that are on offer right now. But if you click on that little tab there, quality, um, it highlights the, the other criteria we're looking at: quality rating above seventy. And quality rating is important in the sense I'm looking for companies that are consistent with their earnings. They're not uh, a volatile. They don't have volatile earnings. They have consistent and stable earnings and its growth and things like that. So there's the two criteria combined together, value and quality. Okay. So that is, um, out of that list, um, I'm using example, you might look, look at Astral, so you just click on the share code on the previous list. Um, this was updated now the 13th of November. You can see on, on the peg ratio, it's green, so that's what we call uh, undervalued stock. Okay. So obviously from here, you go look at the technicals now, look at your timing. Uh, remember that was now uh, uh, very recent. You can see how the share has jumped up. Uh, this, is, this is anticipation of that results. Um, so, using the fundamentals and technicals together, you'll be making a more informed decision. That's what I call rational analysis. Okay. So that's just using the value approach. Obviously, a lot of principles involved. I'm just running out of time, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. But the main idea is you want to focus on the individual companies not the share market. So this is where it comes back to what we talk about, the bottom-up approach. So you want to compare to the share against its peers and the sector and in the industry and from there move up. Um, the idea is that you want to focus on the long-term earnings outlook, okay, to have a view on that. You want to see companies growing, okay. You want to choose the companies, in the, uh, you want to choose the shares in the best companies, okay. That, that's one of the criteria of value investing. You want to stick to what you know, you want to identify um, the actual value of the share that comes back to what we say NAV or intrinsic value. Only buy when the company is right. That's why it's important to create a watch list of the potential winners that you want to look at. Okay, you don't have to have, cover all the bases. Um, we'll talk about um, how many stocks you want to have in your portfolio, but ultimately, you know, having between eight and twelve shares. That's where you want to build a portfolio around between eight and twelve shares. Okay. The idea here is that uh, you want to hold on to your stocks for the long term. Warren Buffett is a long term investor. Uh, you don't just chop and, set and change all the time. Obviously, it comes back to what we said just now in your investment philosophy. Um, when would you sell the share? Only if the earnings trend is going to change radically or um, there, there are better opportunities somewhere else. Okay. But you're not going to just sell because the market price is higher. That's the main thing. You don't want to sell because you want to take profits. Okay. And obviously, if you're buying and selling, buying and selling, then you're not an investor anymore, you're a trader, obviously your costs are much higher. Okay. This is a quote from Warren Buffett. Um, there's quite a few books written about him. This is one of the first books I ever read. This is one of his famous quotes. Sorry, let's go back there. Price is what you pay. 
value what you, is what you get. So a 5 rand share can be expensive relative to, to earnings, and a 500 rand share can be cheap relative to earnings. So this is what he means by that, that calculation. Okay. So there is value investing. Let's talk about uh, uh, investment strategy called GARP, or Growth at a Reasonable Price. And this is a, a guy called uh, Peter Lynch. It's one of the first books I also read about Peter Lynch. And I like his approach in the sense that um, he was also a fund manager uh, from, from 1977 to 1990. He managed a, a, a fund called Magellan, which is part of Fertility. And there's a whole range of, uh, of funds in Fertility's uh, um, 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 group as such. But he managed a fund called Magellan. And over that period, the average return was 29% per annum. Now that's very, very good. If you consider also the size of the fund. At that point in time, it was a $40 billion fund. So not many people have ever done that for such a long time. But his main strategy, and he attributes success to the skill of finding investment opportunities in the areas that he was familiar with already. And I like this approach in the sense that he looked at companies that uh, that his family and himself had a positive personal experience with as a consumer. So I use the example of going to Nando's or going to, to Wimpy. Wimpy is part of the uh, famous brands group. If you like the Wimpy food, you might consider going to the steer and you think, wow, this franchise, they know how to get food out consistently. And then obviously uh, go look at, 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 at the company's for, uh, financials afterwards. But um, this was his approach. Um, he looked at uh, the fundamental secondary, where he first wanted to understand the company and then looked at the financials. So you'd, you'd go look at shopping malls and go look at the shops and then the brands and see which, shop, which brands you were selling the most and then at the prices and, as I say, at the balance sheet. Okay. So his approach was looking at more of the obscure companies, the, the less well-known ones, and he was looking for turnaround strategies, uh, more recovery situations, so he was a, 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 a contrarian investor. He was looking for companies where everyone else was ignoring. Okay. Um, and it mainly with his approach was you only need to find five stocks um, that you need to keep track of. So a bit different approach to value investing. Um, but I, as I say, I like to have a bit of a blend in my portfolio. By the way, his uh, Peter Lynch coined the phrase uh, the 10 bagger. Um, ten bag is you're looking for companies going to give you ten times your money within five years. So if you got five stocks, going back to that 80-20 uh, Pareto principle, if you can find five stocks that give you ten, uh, give you a, uh, give you ten baggers, uh, that's the kind of thing you're looking for. Okay. So GARP, uh, 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 Peter Lynch coined the phrase uh, GARP, which is a hybrid between growth and value investing. Um, I also like the, the, the acronym SWAN, which stands for Sleep Well at Night. Um, so GARP, the GARP, GARP approach to investing combines uh, value and growth together. The growth, you get more turnover growth and that kind of stuff, relative to earnings and the size of the companies and things like that. Whereas value investors, remember I was saying we we're looking for, for bargains, looking for shares that are, are relatively cheap compared to the earnings that net asset value. Corp, we're looking at companies growing faster than, than their peers or, the, or than other companies. So we're not only looking at companies, for, companies in trouble in, in necessary, we're looking for, and not, not only looking for companies that are flying, high flying stocks, we're looking for companies that are still undervalued, but uh, the historical growth and stock price, that's what's important. Okay, so we're looking at the, the company itself, is the company growing organically as opposed to uh, acquisitions? Uh, the headline earnings is it growing more than 15%? That's our benchmark we like to look at. Uh, so is that earnings growth what's important? So we're still bringing a bit of fu uh, fundamentals. Yeah, we're looking at the peg ratio, as long as it's less than 100. Um, we still say that's what we classify as fairly valued. Um, so, you know, it's not a perfect strategy. Uh, you know, on the, one coin you're looking for on the one side of the coin, you're looking for companies that are, are, are undervalued, but you're also looking for companies that are growing. So the danger of this is that you can build up a portfolio that's going to have mediocre stocks in your portfolio. That's why, again, I like to have a fruit salad approach, a bit of value, a bit of uh, 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 growth in my portfolio. So going back to the website, you guys, you go click on research, click on a search, and this is where you click on this little button here, growth at a reasonable price. 
So this is a starting point. You want to focus on the companies that are growing more than 15%. Again, you want to click on the share codes. I've just chosen one of the companies. Um, here's a company called Altron. In this situation, based on their last earnings, 18.4%. Uh, Granted, this company is coming off a low base, um, but remember, this is all part of the strategy. You want to do analysis and, 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 and uh, dig a bit deeper. Okay. Ideally, you want to look at companies like it's growing its turnover by more like 15-20%. Nuspass, for example, is growing its turnover by 30%. That's a growth company, and you'll see that being reflected in, in, in the share price itself. Okay. Again, you can see, going back to the technicals, uh, people anticipate the results going forward. That's where we've got discounting. Obviously, you want to take advantage of that. So it has drifted back. It's come back into overbought territory. Um, so you want to combine the fundamentals together with the technicals, and that's what we call rational analysis. Okay. Um, so let me just go back to my, my uh, normal tool. Uh, okay. Let me see if any questions coming through here. Uh, okay, jeez, I've got no questions. Ah, here's one question. Um, here's a question from Johan. It says, um, can the value approach be applied to mining stocks? Uh, I presume you're referring to the peg, the peg ratio. Um, the, the, the challenge of the value approach, uh, and that's why it's important to look at quality, um, Johan, is that, um, especially the mining stocks, mining stocks, um, there's volatility in the earnings. One year they, they're profitable, one year they, they lost making. And you'll see some of the PE ratios, they're actually negative, and that's referring to a company's got a loss making situation. So the challenge of using the PEG ratio, obviously, it's is skewed in the sense that uh, um, you're looking for consistency. So I prefer when I look at mining companies, I look at price NAV, and I try and look for companies that are trading at a discount to price NAV. Alternatively, yes, you can compare one share to another share by using the PE ratio. Um, so that's the, the danger with looking at mining stocks, or um, especially the gold mining stocks. Um, when it comes more to the resources, as I say, I prefer to look at the price NAV. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. But again, I, I, refer, I suggest you refer to that sector analysis on, on the tutorials. It goes into more detail. Thanks, Sean, for your question. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Just send it through. Okay, let's go into the last law strategy, investing for um, income uh, or investing for dividends. Um, this is one of the most straightforward share selection strategies. Um, you want to look for companies that provide just a, a steady stream of income every month or every quarter or every year. So um, this is obviously for the investors looking for income compared to capital growth. So obviously more the mature investor looking for income. Um, I like to have this in my portfolio anyway as, as, as an investor because um, I can use it for reinvesting into my portfolio and uh, it just uh, compounds. So I'm using a combination of ordinary shares, bonds and preference shares. Um, remember I'm looking for regular and substantial dividends. So yes, the focus will be on more the older, more established companies and that's what we call blue chip shares. These are companies that give you a very predictable earning stream. So, for example, we've had a, a million rand investment on a 5 or 6 percent dividend yield. Um, I'm looking for companies that uh, it's going to give me at least 5 or 50 to 60 percent in income. Obviously, that's after tax when we have this 15 percent dividend withholding tax now. But saying that, you don't just want to invest on the basis of the dividends alone. High dividends, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a, it's a good company. You know, dividends, have to be paid out of net income, and not, they're not paid out of capital, okay? Remember? So you can only pay out dividends out of profits. So um, what about future growth? If the company's paying out all its earnings, what about future growth? So that's a little uh, a, a thing to look at into, into also. Um, large dividends um, sometimes can be better spent within a, a, a company. I remember a few years ago, Microsoft only started paying out uh, dividends uh, only after a few years in the sense that in the past they used to use, reinvest all the dividends back into the company. Remember, it's a source of capital for the company. Okay. So um, the, the, the strategy is such, there are risks involved. Um, the value of the original investment can drop. Um, number one, obviously, perception that future earnings and things like that can change. But also the distribution and level of payments are not guaranteed. 
Obviously, we would preference shoulders. We will get paid the, the, the difference first before all the shoulders. But there's no guarantees, you know. Um, sometimes the company might uh, go into financial hardship and uh, prefer to hold on to the dividends and reinvest back into the business. Uh, or they might see better investment opportunity and obviously it requires significant cash outlay. This role they use the dividends instead of paying it out. So those kind of things can change. Um, so it's important to always just uh, do your homework, uh, look at the company's fundamentals and not just not only the dividend yield. So income investing or dividend investing is not is not is a perfect science. Um, you want to build up a diversified portfolio to eliminate some of those, risk, those risks. Again, it comes back to what I call my fruit salad strategy. Okay, so again on our website, um, sorry, uh, there's two things you can look at. Let me go back to my little cursor, uh, my spotlight. Uh, click on research, click on the research the search pattern, and so the shortcut key I clicked on investing for dividends. So there was a criteria. Um, obviously, dividends is, 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 is greater than 30. That would be on the next slide. Um, that's the, the payout ratio. But there's the dividend yield. So the average of the market is about 2.5 to 3%. I like to look for companies more than that, preferably 5% plus. By the way, we click on, on research and go look at um, um, uh, recommendations. You'll also see a top 10 by dividends. You see some of those companies paying out more than 7%. Um, and on the next slide, we click on quality, quality rate, quality view, by the way, you see the payout ratio. So these companies are paying out more than 30%, um, some of them paying out 50%. Correlation, for example, pays out more than 100, or pays out 100% of the, of the, uh, of the earnings in the form of dividends. Okay. It's that growth in that company has been reflected in the share price, uh, while it's doing so well. So this is another way of, of, of finding shares for your investment portfolio by looking at dividends. Uh, as I say, remember, it's a, it's a, my definition of financial freedom is living off the income from your investments. Um, and that's my definition of, of financial freedom. Okay. So in that, from that list is a company called Bocoff. Uh, this at uh, this point in time, uh, 4%. Uh, two days ago, 4.3%. Remember, the average of the market, 2.5%. So, um, this company has fallen off a lot, it is oversold, so this is a company you might take and it might be a bit of a value uh, approach also, which is a value stock right now. I like it, it's a, it's a classic company, um, and yes, people don't like it in the sense that the share price is falling, but I believe there's opportunities there, not only uh, from a value point of view, but remember also, the other ones. Okay. So, a quick summary before we start hitting any qu more questions as such. Um, the, the, the three different approaches. Value investing is, is, a, is a defensive investment approach, more suitable for a bear market. And the last three, four days, you might think, gee, we've been in the bear market, the market has fallen more than a thousand points. But uh, that's why I like to have this, this uh, a blend between the three different approaches. I might have some value stocks in my portfolio, I might have some guard put shares in my portfolio, and I might, all of them I always try and look for shares that are going to give me some, some income as such. But growth at a reasonable price of bulk, uh, this is great for a bull market. I'm looking for undervalued, high growth share of potential stocks. Um, that's the approach I'm looking for there. When I'm looking for investing for dividends, yes, I'm looking at more the, the blue chip shares. Companies been around for a bit longer, more established companies that are paying out regular and substantial dividends. So yes, it will be the borrowers and the bid best and things like that. So there are some of those elements in the portfolio. Okay. So a quick summary, your goal is to develop your own style of investing. Now you want to come, so I like to use what I call rational analysis, combine fundamentals and technicals together. You know, just looking at fundamentals alone, it's like saying you can do one or, if I'm just using one or, I'm going to go in circles. If I'm using two ors, yes, I'm doing more homework, but I'm, I'm asking myself more questions and I've got another company more, uh, as I say, it's a, it's a more clearer approach to the market. That's my, my opinion. So within that uh, a, a, a strategy, I like to have growth and value and a dividends from a fundamental point of view. Um, obviously, technical is a different, a different webinar, but again, there's three, three scenarios I'm looking for there. I'm looking for shares must be trending, must be oversold, and outperforming the market. And that's all part of the rational analysis approach. When I'm looking at, um, as I say, there we go, there's bullish, oversold, and outperforming. Um, 
the main thing is what have matched your investment strategy to your personality. If you feel that you that that uh, geez, you can't sleep at night or you find this is, is frustrating you, it's not moving fast enough, change it. Consider changing your strategy at such time that you're happy with it. Okay. So um, in conclusion, um, go look at our online tutorials and then test your, your ideas and strategies in a risk-free scenario. So we have a trading a trading simulator that's obviously based on the top 100 companies. But uh, use the tools to help you find those, of those shares as such. I've been referring to technical analysis. There's a software available. So I went software. The software is for free. Or we do subscribe to the download service. Okay. So this, this presentation and the reporting will be emailed to you um, in the next day or so. Um, just be patient. Okay. Guys, I uh, hope you found this uh, presentation beneficial. There's my, uh, my email address and my, uh, my, my contact number. Um, let me see if there's any questions that come through. Um, take us uh, through the graphs and the, and the meaning. Uh, this is a question from uh, uh, Matthew, Matthias, sorry, Matthias. Uh, thank you for the graphs. Um, I don't want to go through it right now um, because obviously the focus is more on on the fundamentals and investment strategy. But um, you know there are uh, past tutorials that I can refer to or past uh, webinars that goes into more of the details about understanding technicals. But very simply, it's, it's, it's trend analysis, moving averages. As the share price is above the moving average, the trend is up. That's number one you want to look for. Secondly. Obviously, the market goes up and down. There stages where the market's at the top of the cycle, the bottom of the cycle. Ideally, you want to buy at the bottom of the cycle, and that's where they're overbought, oversold, or uh, MACD indicator comes in handy. And then you also look for shares that are outperforming the market, and that's where the strength comes into. So when you get this presentation, to make more sense, um, when you look at those charts, um, looking for shares relative to the market, the trend must be up. I'm going with potential winners, and I'm looking at volume accumulation. Uh, I want to see the fund managers get into that stock, so the volume must confirm price action. So, um, sorry, I can't see your name properly. I just half cut off, but uh, I hope that answers your question for you. Uh, uh, sorry, it was from from Matthew. Matthew, as I say. Um, Fundamentals is the main focus today, but technically uh, that was a very quick introduction. Ah, uh, here's another question. I thought it might come up. Nazir, thank you for, for, for this question on property stocks um, from a valuation point of view. You see on our website that we don't have really a, a, a research from a value point of view on property. Because at the end of the day, property stocks is rental income. So um, a, a big ratio in that will not be applicable to them. Um, so yes, you know, maybe look at P ratios, and what I find more and more important for me is is, is the dividend yield. Obviously, when you look at, at, at property companies, it's not much the dividend yield because obviously you're getting interest uh, interest payments back, but um, they're very attractive uh, property companies because they, the perception is the higher uh, dividend yield. But remember, that's interest, which is taxable anyway. Um, so yes, it doesn't really uh, apply. Uh, the peg to to the property market because uh, remember it's rental income. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Nazir. Thanks for the question. Uh, here's a question from Obi regarding uh, uh, what I think about the talk that the market as a whole is overbought, uh, overvalued right now. Rather, okay. Yes, I agree. The market is overvalued, and that refers to my one slide when I said I scanned the whole market and I need. 10 shares out of, out of 400 stocks listed in the market is considered uh, uh, undervalued. So yes, most of the stocks in the market are fairly valued. I wouldn't say it's overvalued. There are some certain stocks that are overvalued based on the peg and things like that. Um, but um, yes, I'll, I'll go with that, that the market is, if you look at the P ratio, the average of the market is, is 18. Rather, stocks, especially the retailers, are trading way over that. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you on that point as such. 
Uh, it's a question from Donnie. Yes, you joined a bit late. Yes, the presentation will be sent to you with the recording, Donnie. So don't worry about that. Okay. Um, there's a question from uh, Dion. What percentage stop loss would you hedge or share? Uh, okay. When it comes to long-term investing, good question, Donnie. When it comes to long-term uh, uh, buying a whole strategy, the only time I'll ever sell a share in my portfolio is that it becomes overvalued based on the value investor, based on the peg ratio. It goes red on valuation. Then I might put a 20% stop loss. A 20% stop loss on an overvalued stock in my long-term portfolio. So if it drops 3% from there, I, I, I might consider selling. Um, but remember, and, and this is a question I had last night at uh, last night's uh, Traders Forum, uh, why not sell out a stock uh, that you perceive that's, that's um, um, got a fall instead of hedging it, you've seen the stock futures and things like that. My strategy is buy and hold. I'm going to buy into good quality stocks with a long term view. That's my main strategy as an investor. Um, I prefer to have two different uh, accounts for trading, uh, one for trading, one for investing. Um, if I look at trading, I'd rather use uh, CFDs and things like that. That's why I use position trading. But as an investor, my goal is to buy uh, good quality stocks. Stocks could be around for long term. I want my children to inherit my portfolio one day. Okay, that's my main goal. So as an investor, I want to build up a portfolio big enough for them to, to live off the income one day. That's my main goal. So Donnie, to answer your question, I'll use a 3% stop loss once it hits a peg ratio of overvalued um, if I had to use that in a long-term portfolio. So, Dion, sorry, Dion, not Donnie. Dion, I hope that answers your question. Um, is investing in Altex uh, companies uh, a good start if I have low capital? This is a question from Fungai. Um, yes, that comes back to the question I mentioned earlier about, about, about small caps uh, and the quality. There are some small cap stocks, especially on the, the Altex, that are uh, uh, good quality companies. So yes, they are undervalued. And, you, and remember, big ratios, plus NAV, PE ratio. Those are the first criteria. What's important is also cash flow and uh, the quality of the company, as well as the, obviously, interest cover. If, you, if it meets all those criteria, then go for those companies. So you don't have to go and invest in those companies, uh, optics, if you've got low capital. You know, penny stocks, uh, well, not at the end of the day, uh, 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 good investments because sometimes those five rand, sh they, they were five rand and now they're five cents. So that, the market is telling me something about those companies. People see that I could take my thousand rand, go buy a, a, few, a, a few thousand shares at five cents, go from five cents to ten cents, I've doubled my money. The challenge of that is you have to go buy quite a lot of shares to make it worthwhile. Secondly, there are thousands and thousands of other investors before you that have the same idea. So I'd rather say save up for where you get a bit more capital and rather go buy 10 shares in a higher quality company or into a mid cap or a small cap stock. Now, the thousand rand can still buy better quality stocks instead of buying into a penny stock. So just be careful of that, having that kind of a philosophy as such. Um, it will take time to study them. Yeah, the, the, the advantage of, of looking at the small caps or the old tech companies is that they're mainly in the niche market. So compared to a company like Bitvest, big, or big companies got 500 companies in one, they're taking more time analyzing a, a large cap stock, whereas a small cap, they might have one or two little businesses. Uh, I remember years ago, I was looking at a company called One Logics. Their main business was, uh, was uh, um, um, vehicle delivery systems, VDS. Uh, they also had PostNet, but uh, they had one or two little companies within their businesses. So it was easy to analyze those companies. So that I hope that answers your question too. Okay. Jan, thanks for your feedback. Great presentation. Great. Thanks, Jan. Uh, um, Andres, thanks for your feedback too. Thanks. Okay. Um, Dion, what's the current uh, all the PE? Uh, oof. Or for hand, I think around, it's around about 18, if I remember lastly. So any companies trading below 18 would be considered cheap relative to the market, whereas companies trading obviously over 18 would be considered expensive. So Dion, I'm saying to be corrected, I think it's about 18. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, uh, do you have access to previous webinars? Um, yes, obviously I've got a record of them. Uh, just email me, tell me what you want to be focused on, uh, and I'll send them through to you. 
Okay. So guys, um, I hope that uh, looks like that's all the questions. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for the feedback. Yeah, great. I hope you, glad you enjoyed it. Uh, that's it. We talked at all the questions. Okay. But guys, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I hope you found it beneficial. Um, remember that this is my, is my, my little disclaimer was at the end of the presentation. Um, the, uh, the examples I used in this wasn't meant to, to solicit any uh, uh, trades from you guys. Uh, just for education purposes only. Um, yes, some of the shares I do own, so be careful with that also. Okay. But guys, thank you very much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed it. As I say, I'll be sending this presentation to you. Please, uh, any comments you have, email me. More uh, more, I prefer more if you go to our Facebook page and, uh, and make comments there so everybody else can learn from it. But thanks a lot for your uh, time and that, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye for now.